I'm thrilled to be talking today to John Owen and David Owen. David here, John here, and they are the sons of Sir Alfred Owen, who is watching us from behind. Gentlemen, what are your earliest memories of the BRM project? Well, it was quite early in my career. I would have only been about uh, 13, that sort of uh, period. Um, so, and being at boarding school, I suppose, um, it took, took a little while to, for it to sink in that this was something really important to my father. And uh, he wanted to do it because British engineering needed to be at the forefront in order to sell cars. And we made the components for those cars and we would have been up against Italy and Germany and France. So we joined the gang and went for it. You were well, I remember um, back, it must have been 1949, I think, um, for some reason I was with my father when he went over to Eastgate House, mm -hmm. Raymond Mays' house in Bourne. Yes. Yes. And I remember meeting um, the rest of the, t the um, trust team. Mm -hmm. I think I sat by uh, Bernard Scott's wife for a time. Why I should remember that, I don't know. But uh, it was quite... Uh, an impressionable age, I suppose, and uh, meeting Raymond Mays at that time with his uh, uh, outgoing personality and his deep voice, his constant chain smoking. He was quite a character mm. and mm. Um, made a bit of an impression on uh, me as a, as a young boy of, I suppose, 10. How was your father's working relationship with Raymond Mays and, of course, Peter Burton? Well, I think he got on very well with Raymond Mays. They happened to have gone to the same school some years apart. They didn't know each other at school. But um, I suppose they had the same sort of background. Um, their fathers were both businessmen and uh, um, in personality, of course, they were totally different. Uh, but they always got on well together. They had a polite and friendly, genuinely friendly relationship. Mm -hmm. um, Berthen was a bit different. He was a, a bit of a roué, perhaps, um, looking back mm. on him, uh, mm. one could say. And his wife was quite a personality in her own right. And uh, I think they swam in a different pool to the one my father swam in. Okay. Um, they got on, but yes. uh, they mm. weren't close. How did your father react to the early frustrations well, I think um, my father's favourite phrase, and I shall never forget it and still think of it today, was stickability. Stickability. <laughs> stickability. You stick at something until you've won. Mm. You never give up. And so he had that sort of... Yes, he could f be frustrated by many things, but he realised the problems, I think, of doing something the very first and you're bound to hit various issues and problems. You can't get it right first time. And don't forget, we were building the whole car. We weren't using somebody else's engine. And that's another story, mm. how uh, brilliant every single component and part of that first V16 BRM was made in Britain. Yes, and an extraordinary number of parts, of course, in the car, in particular the engine, but uh, I forget the statistics now, but it's a quite amazing number of parts. I think so. I think I remember the figure of 30,000. I think so, Something yes. Something like that. Yes, it's absolutely. Colossal, yeah. Yes, indeed. Do you think in those early days, with a frustrating period, during the early and mid-50s, was your father ever tempted to chuck the towel in? No, never. No, because his stickability, the stickability won through. I've never known my father chuck the towel in for anything. Mm. Mm. Really? Yes. In in fact, he went on with certain things way beyond the uh, um, area of common sense, and uh, he wouldn't close anything down, even if it was making uh, huge losses. 
really? he was always determined to pull it round. Yes. Yes. Uh, something we had to do something about when yes. we mm. finally had to, at sh rather short notice, take over the business. I suppose today we would say he was very focused. He was focused, yes. uh, but uh, he always had some idea of how something could be pulled round, and yeah. as, as long as there was hope, he'd uh, mm. he'd keep battling away. Mm. And then, of course, finally the victory in '59, the Dutch Grand Prix. Do you have any recollections of that? That must have been a high high spot. Well, we weren't there, unfortunately. <laughs> it, was, it would have been a high spot, mm. but uh, I think um, for several years past, the the car, that car had been doing some decent performances in the yes. hands of uh, Jean Berra and uh, Harry Shell yes. and others and uh, really 59 was uh, long overdue for our first win. I mean Berra had a, was, took part in a 1-2-3 victory at Silverstone, mm. not, not in a Grand Prix, mm. but that car was quite successful Yes, and he won the uh, Grand Prix in Cannes in France. Mm -hmm. um, and other races too, but he never won a Grand Prix. Do you do you remember how your father reacted to that first first oh, win? Yes, I think he was he was very very pleased, and the fact that Joe Bonnier, the driver, you know, wasn't a British driver, and uh, it was really good of Joe Bonnier to beat Jack Brabham in the Brabham. To, who then became world champion. Yes. And here we were at Zandvoort beating the world champion. Mm. So, In a Cooper, with respect. He was driving a Cooper, yes. Jack Brabham. Yes, yes and that, at that time. Oh, was it? Yes. 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 Sorry. Later on, Brabham. <laughs> but of course, then the victories didn't necessarily follow. And your father famously was, was really rather running out of patience and, and gave the team an ultimatum. And of course, it was then that he promoted Tony Rudd who, of course, was a brilliant engineer. Do you think that was the big turnaround, promoting Tony Rudd? Yes, I think it was, and I think it had been obvious for probably a year or two that mm. Tony Rudd was the emerging man who, who should have been in charge earlier than mm. he was. Indeed. And um, in 1962, he made a pretty significant difference once he was in charge. Absolutely. But he'd been there for a long time. I yes, mean, he, he yes. was there from the, I remember first seeing Tony Rudd in the early 50s, I suppose, a when he was seconded from uh, Rolls-Royce Rolls Rolls exactly. to sort out the supercharger yes. on the uh, the old yes. V16. And he uh, always took the trouble to talk to us, even yeah. though uh, he had no reason to, really. But uh, he treated us as adults. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. I have fond memories of interviewing him many years ago and it was a very long and absolutely fascinating career that he had. Yeah. Very distinguished. Yeah. Yes. Deserves That's... great credit. He was an yeah. unusual man in, in many ways. I, I don't think he and Pam got married until they'd got several children. I, oh, really? I, think, my, I think my father <laughs> persuaded him to <laughs> to tie the knot, but he, mm. he was a very nice man. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, a, it's a book still to write, actually. Every engine that BRM designed themselves with experts, um, Tony Rudd and Peter Burton to begin with, every engine, this tiny firm at Bourne, Lincolnshire, won a Grand Prix. Mm. Every single engine we built. Mm. Yes, yes. Mm. Wonderful, wonderful. And then, of course, 1962, that was the great year. The World Championship for Graham Hill, Constructors' Championship for BRM. What are your memories of, of that year? And, uh, and your father's, uh, presumably, he was absolutely delighted with the finally to achieve that. Yes, he was absolutely thrilled. And you've only got to see the photographs of him with Graham to show the real joy in his face. Mm. I've done it. We've done it. And uh, it's the fact that he had the photograph not by himself but with Graham because he had a they had a very very good relationship mm. my father and Graham. Mm -hmm. mm. Did you have much to do with Graham yourself? Well, we always had a chat at uh, at races. He yes. was he was always uh, 
I was going to say he was an outgoing man, but he, he was actually quite private just mm. before a race. He, mm. he didn't want to chat very much, but he was always um, friendly, and we got to know Betty quite yeah. well as well. Uh, as well. Yeah. A, bit, a bit of a lad, Graham, perhaps, um, <laughs> in his day. Wonderful he, sense of humour. He humor. wouldn't mind admitting that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the other thing that... Uh, um, I mean, the sad thing was the aircraft accident... Oh. And, and uh, um, the one thing it brought us very close to Betty, mm -hmm. and uh, even before that, Betty had come to our twenty-five year celebration of the Owen Motoring Club, and uh, I kept contact with Betty. We exchanged Christmas cards, and um, just helped. I hope. Yes, I'm to keep sure. that relationship going. Yes, yes. She was a lovely person. She was indeed, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It was her suggestion that we should do a book on Graham some years ago now, which was an absolute honour to do, of course. Now, the other uh, tremendous driver of that period for BRM was, of course, we Jackie, Jackie, Jackie Stewart. Yeah. Yes. What are your recollections of, of Jackie's involvement? I remember first meeting Jackie, I think it must have been 1965, and uh, my then fiancé and I, um, it was the first trip abroad together, we went to the Monaco Grand Prix and, and Jackie was there with Helen, so we got to know them a bit then, mm. and uh, yes, he was a brilliant driver and yeah. an extremely nice man, yes. even now, sadly, yeah. Helen has, uh, mm. has got problems, but... Uh, Indeed. Jackie has been a great friend to BRM over many, many years, and, yes. and David's probably had more contact with him than, than I have. Yes, I mean, super relationship with Jackie, and mm. still is today. Yes. And um, I can't say why. I think the thing with, with Jackie was he never forgot Graham coming and helping him when he had that accident. Mm -hmm. And yes. he was full of praise. He said, Tony Rudd has designed a brilliant car which saved me. And he really meant that. Mm. And uh, then his charitable work, I think, was something marvellous that he instituted and still carries on today. So, uh, yes, he's mm. such a positive person um, in so many ways and uh, a great credit to British motor racing for all his achievements, not only as a driver, but for looking after other people and the story of his sad wife mm. suffering from her dementia. So that is a huge cause for him, which we try to support with him as well. Absolutely, and we're delighted to have a Graham Hill and indeed a Jackie Stewart uh, editions, special editions of mm. the book we are doing mm. and uh, the one we're doing with Jackie is of course supporting the uh, Race Against Dementia charity. Now you've had an extraordinary roll call of great drivers over the years right through from Fangio and Gonzalez right through to Stewart and and uh, Rodriguez and Beltoise etc. Who do you think was the greatest of all? I suppose the one who is acknowledged by most racing drivers as being the greatest of all, and it's pretty idle to make comparisons between generations, but Indeed. I think they mostly acknowledge that Fangio had that something special mm. that uh, separated him from ordinary mortals. Mm. Uh, I know not everyone agrees with that, but having seen him driving the V16 for the very first time at Fockingham, and uh, I think on his first flying lap, he, he was quicker than anyone else had been in it before. Really? Uh, a lap later, I think he went off and damaged the exhaust, but uh, he was really giving it some stick. Yes, yes, yes. I, I wouldn't like to choose, because I think they were all great on their day. Mm. And it was, uh, I can remember Tony Rudd saying that um, each of the drivers, he had to listen and tailor the car Mm. to what the driver wanted mm. and that gave them the really winning chance to make it and when he came to Fangio he doesn't know what he wants he just 
has what he's got mm -hmm. and makes it work. Mm -hmm. Incredible. How interesting. But Graham, he wants it thoroughly tested and he's particular yes. to get the car set up absolutely the way he wants it. Yes. And if you set it up the way I want it, I'll win a Grand Prix. Jackie, I've never really asked, but mm. I can imagine it was a combination of both. Mm. Yeah. It, they just had mm. to be good and safe. Yes. And that's what he yes. admired about BRM. And I think he mentions that in one of his books. Mm. He felt mm. safe driving a BRM. Mm. Do you have a favourite BRM? Mm. For me personally, I think it is, perhaps I was at the most impressionable age, it, it was the B16 yes. and uh, yes. th that was one of the reasons I commissioned the building of a indeed a, another V16 yes. that hopefully we shall see one day racing because that's how it should be seen. It never fulfilled its um, promise um, until too late, sadly, but uh, I would like to see it fulfill its promise even 70 years after the event. Well, I don't think people realise that at that time it was such a difficult period for British engineering and industry. The quality of materials, the length of time it took to obtain materials yeah. or machined parts or whatever, but then the quality of the metal mm -hmm. and that's something was so questionable, so variable, uh, that, that so often that was a challenge too far. There so, was that too, but um, I think if one's honest, the um, the Burton approach was always mm, a bit over ambitious. Mm, he, yes. he always went for the nth degree to, mm. to try and get perfection, mm -hmm. and uh, if it wasn't available, he, he would still mm. try. Mm. Mm. And uh, of course, they didn't have the money in those days to develop it properly, and they didn't give it the time that was necessary to, mm. to do so. So mm. there were lots of reasons why that particular yes. car failed but it still to me is the uh, the most magnetic of the cars mm. I ever saw race. Mm. Mm. Well, it's wonderful to see and hear the cars again fantastic and uh, many congratulations on, on recreating them with Hall and well, Hall. It's Hall and Hall. Well, indeed. must take the credit they've done, they've, a, they've done job. a super job. Absolutely. I do think you, if David, I have yes. a favourite it's probably the two and a half litre. Mm -hmm. Because um, um, Sterling Moss loved driving it and yes. became second in, as you know, in British Grand Prix at Aintree in a privately entered two and a half litre. And when we had the day at Donington for BRM, Sterling came, it was a great honour that he came, and drove the two and a half litre. And he drove it as well at one of the Silverstone celebration events. And he loved driving the two and a half litre. So nobody didn't like driving it. So I said, that must be my favourite because they all like driving the two and a half litre. <laughs> Your Aunt Jean was a most delightful lady. Yeah. I have fond memories of uh, many, many years ago of staying at the family house. And, uh, but uh, not wishing to be controversial, but why did your father hand over, as it were, to Louis Stanley? Well, he didn't. Um, he was taken ill with a severe stroke right. in October of 1969. Right. And David and I were immediately pitched into the uh, chief executive positions of uh, running the business. And we had to do something to sort out BRM. We had a business to run. We certainly didn't have time to devote to BRM. Um, we had a good relationship with uh, our aunt, Jean, and uh, she'd been travelling around with the team for the previous 10 years she or so. She was very enthusiastic. She knew she? everything that was going yes. on. She was a third shareholder in the parent yes. business. Yes. It just made sense for, for us to give her the responsibility of, of carrying on with the team. Mm. I mean, she obviously wasn't running it on a day-to-day -day basis. Sure. Tony Rudd was still doing that. but. Um, Indeed. Indeed. She was giving it oversight and mm. uh, of course her husband uh, Louis was with her in, in doing that. Indeed. And here we are now fast forwarding many many years, many decades and uh, your, your sons are reviving the BRM name now. You must be very proud that they are doing so and delighted I imagine. Is that the case? 
Yes, I'm uh, on the board actually and uh, trying to give them every support, but I, I made it clear right from the outset I wasn't going to getting involved in the nitty gritty. I'd be there as a sort of uh, background if they wanted to talk about anything, but uh, I'm not doing any of the hard work. Yes, I think it's uh, very interesting. I think we're in the world today. I mean, as you know, uh, uh, things change. And uh, why is the Black Country Living Museum successful? Because it celebrates the past. It celebrates British workmanship. Indeed. And I think that's a, in the vogue a little bit at the moment. How long it'll last, I don't know. But we're celebrating the fourth generation, as celebrating the achievements of a totally British car where every single component is made in the UK and was made in the UK. And the other interesting thing is the impact of, um, if you like, uh, what do we call it? Um, old, old cars racing, I've forgotten the His, name. Historic racing. Historic racing has become very popular. Indeed. And that is another factor that a lot of enthusiasts um, love historic car racing. Mm. And because that's risen with a generation I mean, where else could you get 70-year-old drivers not continuing to drive and enjoying their driving in Formula One cars? So it's that side of it as well. Enjoyment of life for people as you get older. And uh, it's certainly there. Absolutely. People like Richard Atwood, Absolutely. who's still driving extremely well, who was a, another of the fine BRM drivers in period, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and, and a Midlander. Well, we are very proud indeed to be publishing the book to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the championship year. And uh, we'd like to thank you for your contributions. It's been wonderful chatting to you today and, and hearing your memories. Thank you both very much indeed. Thank That's you. very kind of you. And thank you for producing a marvellous book, which the fourth generation have, are doing. And that's wave the flag. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>